One morning in November of 2011, a wheelchair-bound woman and her full-time caregiver were at home when there was a knock on the front door. The caregiver got up and walked over to the door and opened it up, but there was no one there. And when she looked up and down the road, she didn't see anybody walking or driving away, which was kind of odd. But then she looked down and noticed there was what appeared to be a gift sitting on the front porch, but there was no tag on it. So the caregiver brought the gift inside and put it on the kitchen table and told the woman she was caring for that because this package was not labeled, for now they shouldn't open it. However, later that day, when the caregiver was not paying attention, the woman in the wheelchair was so curious about what this gift was that she grabbed the gift, went into the other room, and opened it up. And the second she did that, absolute chaos ensued. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right podcast because that's all we do and we upload twice a week, once on Monday and once on Thursday. Okay, let's get into today's story. On November 24th, 2011, 23-year-old Victoria Shakte sat in her wheelchair at the dining room table inside of her apartment in Innisfail, Alberta, Canada. On the kitchen table sat a fresh pizza, and then a balloon was tied to the back of one of the chairs. Victoria and her full-time caregiver, Marlene Puninbayan, were celebrating. Marlene, who was originally from the Philippines, had just received her permanent resident status in Canada. This meant that Marlene now was able to receive a range of social benefits provided by the country, and she could now take steps towards becoming an official Canadian citizen. So this was a huge deal for Marlene, and Victoria was just so happy for her. But despite being such good friends and having so much in common and just really getting along, the two women really could not have looked more different. Victoria had dyed red and blonde hair, she had a pierced nose, and she loved wearing really bright colors, in particular red. As for Marlene, she was much more modest, she had dark eyes and dark hair that she always kept perfectly combed, and then even when she wasn't working, she dressed very sensibly. But for anybody who knew these two, Victoria and Marlene seemed like sisters most of the time, and Victoria relied on Marlene more than anybody else in her life. When Victoria was just 16 years old, she had been in this terrible car accident. Her friend, who was driving, was speeding at over 140 miles per hour when they lost control and flipped the car. The accident had left Victoria a quadriplegic, which meant she suffered significant paralysis below her neck. Now, at the time, Victoria's friends and family were obviously so relieved that Victoria had survived the accident. But, I mean, looking at her paralysis, you know, her friends and family were worried that Victoria's life would ever go back to being even close to what it used to be. But even at a young age, Victoria had always been very resilient and put her faith wholly in God. And so through the years of extensive medical treatments, she always stayed positive and strong. And over time, she had actually regained some movement in her arms and hands, and she had sort of built a new life for herself. Now, that life was very different from the one she had growing up, but she still cherished it. And Victoria's life had only gotten better when Marlene had become her caregiver and physiotherapist three years earlier. In addition to helping Victoria with her physical therapy, Marlene helped prepare food, she got Victoria ready for the day, and she kept the apartment clean. Marlene also helped look after Victoria's seven-year-old daughter, Destiny. Back at the kitchen table, Marlene and Victoria ate their pizza and talked about how exciting it was that Marlene was now one step closer to becoming a Canadian citizen. After they finished eating, Marlene got up and began to clean the kitchen, and Victoria wheeled herself down the hall to her daughter's room. Destiny's door was cracked open, and Victoria could see her daughter sleeping soundly. Victoria smiled. There were times when she looked at her daughter and just felt like bursting out into tears of joy because she believed her daughter really was a miracle. When Victoria had gotten into that car accident, she was four months pregnant. Victoria had been pinned in the wrecked car for 45 minutes before EMTs could get to her, and by the time she was taken to the hospital, she feared she had lost the baby. But five months later, her daughter had been born happy and healthy. Victoria chose the name Destiny because she felt like it had been her destiny to have this little girl. Then, years later, Victoria and her daughter had moved to the small town of Innisfail, which is said to get its name from an Irish word that meant Isle of Destiny. So, watching her daughter sleep soundly that night, Victoria felt like, you know, everything that had happened in her life, including the accident that paralyzed her, had happened for a reason, and that she was meant to be exactly where she was right now with Destiny and with Marlene. Later in the evening, Victoria was starting to feel worn out, so she asked Marlene for some help. 
Victoria said she needed to make an important phone call. So Marlene pushed her down the hall to a small home office, and then she left. That way, Victoria could have some privacy on her call. Then Victoria called her financial advisor, Brian Malley. Brian had been a friend of the family for years. He ran a successful construction business, and he had played a huge role in making Victoria's ground floor apartment more wheelchair accessible for her. Brian also owned a small financial firm in town where he worked with locals and people in the area, helping them invest, balance budgets, and manage their money. And managing money had been another major way that Brian had been helping Victoria. Years after her accident, Victoria had sued the person who had been driving the car that hit her, and she had been awarded a settlement of about 575000 Canadian dollars. With so much money, Victoria had turned to Brian for some guidance, and he had worked to help her make some smart investments and to limit her spending. Brian answered the phone, and for a few minutes, he and Victoria just caught up on what was going on in their lives. Victoria told him the good news about Marlene becoming a permanent resident, and Brian told Victoria that he was excited because he was making the two-hour drive to Edmonton for business and so his wife could go to the opera. After a few minutes of this, Victoria finally brought up the reason that she had actually called. She needed Brian to move several thousand dollars from her investment account into her checking account to cover her rent and bills and things like that. Victoria immediately heard Brian exhale sort of frustratedly. He told her he was getting concerned about her spending and that her investment account had really begun to dwindle significantly over the past year. Brian tried not to sound too harsh, but he told Victoria that he really couldn't understand why she wasn't sticking to the budget they had laid out for her. Victoria fell silent for a second, and then in a very quiet voice, she said to Brian that the reason she needed more money was to help her family. Brian said he totally understood how important taking care of family was to Victoria, but he said, you know, you're one of five kids and you're giving too much money to your siblings. Now, even though Brian did not specifically say this, Victoria knew what Brian was really saying was there was one sibling in particular that Victoria was helping that Brian did not agree with, and that was one of her brothers. The young man had a very serious history of drug use, and Brian was very sure he was just throwing away the money Victoria was giving him to feed his drug addiction. But ultimately, you know, Brian knew it was Victoria's decision what she did with her money, and so Brian said he would call his office and see what he could do about moving the money. But he urged Victoria to really think hard about whether it was worth giving away all this money. After Victoria hung up, she found herself thinking about her family. After she had gotten that court settlement, her first instinct was to use that money to better the lives of everybody in her family. And she had done that, and she was really happy about it. And so even though she knew Brian was making a good point that maybe it was not the best decision to give all her money away to her siblings, she just felt like she had to. And in fact, she couldn't even imagine not helping her siblings or her family out at this point. In particular, her brother who was struggling with drugs. In fact, Victoria believed her kind of red flag brother deserved the most help out of anybody because of his drug use. A couple of minutes later, Victoria called out to Marlene and asked her to come into the study. When she did, Marlene took Victoria and wheeled her to Victoria's bedroom. There, Marlene massaged Victoria's legs like she did every night, and then she helped her get ready for bed. They talked through their plan for the following day. Destiny had to be at school early, and then Victoria wanted to go see her stepfather. Then after that, they said goodnight to each other, and then Marlene stepped out of the room. For a little while, Victoria just lay awake in bed, feeling more stressed out than usual, and the reason she was stressed was about her money. You know, she was thinking about what Brian said and whether or not it was a good idea to be giving all her money to her siblings and her family. And Victoria, you know, she hated thinking about money. It really stressed her out to begin with. But she also told herself that she was going to see her stepfather the following day, and he always had great advice for her. And so maybe he would have some great financial advice. And so with that in mind, and also Victoria's steadfast belief that, you know, no matter her problems, God had a plan for her, you know, Victoria was able to eventually drift off to sleep. The next morning, so November 25th, 2011, Victoria and Marlene woke up early and made Destiny breakfast and got her off to school. Then, back at the apartment, Marlene helped Victoria get ready to go see her stepfather. But right as they were about to leave, there was a knock at the front door. Marlene walked across the living room and opened the door, but there was nobody there. She looked out into the street, but didn't see anybody walking off, 
Then Marlene looked down at the porch and she saw there was this large, shiny green and gold gift bag that had no tag on it. And so Marlene just picked it up and stared for a second, you know, wondering who had sent it and who it was for. Marlene walked back inside carrying the gift and she told Victoria that she didn't think it was a good idea to open it right now because they had no idea where it came from. But Victoria thought Marlene was acting paranoid. To Victoria, this gift was clearly just an early Christmas present. Marlene disagreed and even suggested they should call the police. Victoria rolled her eyes and said that was a huge overreaction, but she could tell Marlene felt really uncomfortable about this gift, so Victoria promised she would not open it up. Marlene put the gift in the kitchen, and then she and Victoria left and went to go see Victoria's stepfather, who lived only a few minutes away. When they got there, Victoria's stepfather greeted the two women with a huge smile on his face, and he welcomed them into his home. A few minutes after they got there, Marlene helped Victoria to the shower. Victoria's stepfather's shower was actually much more accessible than her own, and so Victoria really enjoyed using it anytime she visited. But the shower also gave her an excuse to catch up with her stepfather. The two had been very close since he came into Victoria's life when she was a young girl, and she often turned to him for advice. So after her shower, Victoria told her stepfather about the money issues she was having that she spoke to her financial advisor, Brian, about the day before. And just like Brian, Victoria's stepfather was also pretty visibly concerned about the fact that Victoria's money was dwindling so quickly. He told her that it was noble that she liked to help everybody she loved, but she needed to remember that that money was hers, and taking care of herself and her daughter should really be her priority, not everybody else. They talked a while longer, and then eventually Victoria asked him if he knew anything about the early Christmas present that had just shown up on her doorstep. At this point, Marlene jumped into the conversation and told Victoria's stepfather that there hadn't been a card or a tag or anything on this present, and she hadn't seen who had left it at the door. And then Marlene said, you know, I told Victoria that we should not only not open this gift, but we should also call the police and let them handle it. And as Victoria's stepfather listened to this, he too started feeling pretty paranoid about this gift. And he told Victoria that, yeah, you should call the police and definitely do not open that bag. You don't know what it is. Victoria couldn't believe what she was hearing. Why was everybody so worried about this early Christmas present? Come on. But at the same time, Victoria did not want to upset people. So she told her stepfather that she would not open the gift. A little bit later, Victoria thanked her stepfather for having them over. She told him she loved him. And then she and Marlene headed home. They got back to the apartment just before 9 a.m. Marlene walked right to the kitchen and began washing dishes from breakfast. She grabbed a plate off the counter and began running water over it, when suddenly there was this huge bang that echoed through the apartment and the entire apartment shook and parts of the ceiling began coming down. And Marlene, you know, she began screaming because she had no idea what was going on. She figured this must be an earthquake, but she didn't know. And so after a second of just pure terror and shock, Marlene turned and ran out of the kitchen and went into the living room yelling out for Victoria because again, she has no idea what's going on here. But when Marlene saw Victoria, she was slumped forward in her wheelchair and blood was pouring out of her neck. And so Marlene just ran through all the dust and the smoke in the room and went out the front door and just started screaming for help at the top of her lungs. A neighbor who lived not far from Victoria's small apartment building had come out of his house after hearing that very loud noise. And now he looked up the street and he saw Marlene screaming for help. And so the neighbor immediately grabbed his phone, dialed 911, and ran to Marlene. And when he reached Marlene, he could see very clearly that she had cuts on her body and she was bleeding. But Marlene kept saying, somebody needs to go inside. Victoria needs help. And the neighbor happened to be a former volunteer firefighter. So he ran into the apartment without hesitation. Once he was inside, there was all this dust and smoke in the air, and it really made it hard to breathe, and he began to cough. But eventually, after walking through the haze, he saw Victoria in her wheelchair, and so he rushed over to her, and he saw she wasn't moving, and so he reached down to check for a pulse or any sign of life. But after a few seconds of just looking at Victoria, it was clear she was already deceased. And so the neighbor ran back out of the house and sat down next to Marlene, who was collapsed on the ground crying, and just took her hand and tried to comfort her as best as he could as they waited for the emergency personnel to arrive. <laughs> 
seconds later, fire trucks, police cruisers, and an ambulance roared through the small town of Innisfail, and they arrived in front of Victoria's apartment just minutes after the neighbor had made that 911 call. First responders helped Marlene and the neighbor off the lawn and then tended to Marlene's cuts. There was no active fire going on inside the apartment, but still, firefighters were the first to go inside. And when they got in there, they quickly identified that clearly an explosion had happened inside of this apartment. And from what they were seeing, the explosion had not been accidental. Someone had set off an incendiary device. And so the firefighters went back outside and they would contact local, regional, and national authorities about what they had just found inside of the apartment. Not long after those calls, members of the Explosives Disposal Unit arrived. Members of the EDU are national and regional Canadian police officers trained to detect, disarm, and dispose of explosive devices like bombs. Several EDU officers filed out of a truck in front of Victoria's apartment. They wore these huge 90-pound bomb suits made from protective materials like Kevlar, and they had helmets and blast shields that covered their heads and faces. Several of Marlene's neighbors had come out onto their porches to watch, and from their perspective, it almost looked like a group of astronauts had invaded their street. Inside of Victoria's apartment, the explosives unit did a thorough sweep of every room to make sure there was no longer a bomb threat, and they concluded that the apartment was clear, and so it was time now for investigators and forensic analysts to take over. Corporal Ken Wardeep de Hill of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is Canada's National Police Force, arrived at Victoria's apartment with several forensic investigators right behind him. De Hill quickly met with the officers who had gotten to the scene first, and they filled him in with information they had taken from Marlene. They told him the woman who had died inside the apartment was Victoria Shakte. She was 23 years old, and she was a quadriplegic. The officers also said that Marlene had told them about some sort of mysterious gift that had been dropped off outside of the apartment earlier that morning without any kind of card or tag on it. DeHill nodded and then scanned the street. The neighbors had now gotten even closer to the scene, trying to figure out what had happened. The officers pushed them back and told them they needed to stay a safe distance away from Victoria's apartment. Amidst this growing crowd, DeHill saw Marlene. She was sitting with first responders with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. He could tell she was in shock. DeHill wanted to talk to her, but first he wanted to get a better idea of what he was dealing with. So he thanked the officers he was talking with for their help, and then DeHill stepped inside the apartment. Forensics analysts told him that they had already found pieces of a galvanized steel pipe, traces of gunpowder, and a lantern battery. Clear signs of a homemade bomb. DeHill tried to take in the entire scene. Parts of the walls and floors had been ripped apart, pieces of furniture had gaping holes in them, debris were scattered everywhere, and strands of plaster hung down from the ceiling like confetti. But the real horror was where Victoria was, in the dining room. DeHill walked into the dining room and approached Victoria. She was sitting in her wheelchair with her head slumped forward. DeHill saw multiple serious wounds on Victoria's neck, as well as bloodstains on her skin and all over her torn clothes. DeHill didn't want to jump to any conclusions, but he had been a member of the Major Crimes Unit for years, and he knew that homicides involving pipe bombs like this were often connected to drug gangs. But that just didn't make sense to DeHill. The victim was a young woman who was paralyzed and who had no criminal history at all. Why would she be mixed up with a drug gang? Corporal DeHill made his way down the hall to the bedrooms. He looked into Destiny's bedroom, and all he could think was how glad he was that Victoria's little girl had been at school when this happened. Minutes later, someone shouted for DeHill out in the dining room. So DeHill stopped what he was doing, and he walked down the hall to the dining room. And when he got there, DeHill saw a forensics officer crouch down, staring at something on the ground. She was staring at something that she just uncovered from the dust and the pieces of the ceiling that had fallen to the floor, and she could not believe what she was looking at. DeHill knelt down beside her, and he looked at what she was staring at, and what he saw was a piece of paper with Victoria's name written on it in colored ink. Marlene had previously told the officers that this Christmas present they received did not have a tag on it, but this piece of paper definitely looked like a tag that would go on a gift, at least to DeHill. The forensics officer told DeHill that finding a scrap of paper like this fully intact after an explosion was almost unheard of. And that little piece of paper gave DeHill a jolt of energy, because it could possibly offer a handwriting sample of the bomber. And even more importantly, potentially there could be the bomber's DNA on the paper. 
So the forensics team bagged up the piece of paper for testing and then continued looking for evidence all throughout the apartment. Later that day, DeHill finally stepped outside of the apartment and the fresh air felt like it might knock him over. He hadn't realized how difficult it was to breathe inside of the apartment. DeHill caught his breath and then noticed Marlene standing by the road with several officers. The wounds that Marlene had suffered during the explosion wound up being quite minor, so she was able to answer any questions that the officers had. And so DeHill saw this as his chance, and so he walked over to her and introduced himself. Marlene wiped away the tears from her face, and then she told DeHill that she had warned Victoria not to open that gift. And so when DeHill heard this, he followed up with, Well, Marlene, why were you so worried about this gift? Did you think somebody was planning to attack Victoria? But Marlene would say, in response to this, that her suspicion about the present had nothing to do with fear that somebody was out to hurt Victoria. She just didn't trust the fact that this present had been dropped off completely randomly a month before the holidays with no tags on it, nothing. It just seemed like something was off about this gift. And then after that, Marlene just sort of broke down. She told the Hill that people loved Victoria and looked to her as an inspiration. Victoria had endured so much for someone so young, but she never let anything stop her. In fact, Victoria often went out of her way to help other people who needed it, whether it was by giving money to her family or volunteering at her church. She was just a very thoughtful person. DeHill told Marlene how sorry he was for her loss and for what she had been through that morning with the explosion. DeHill knew Marlene was physically okay, but he was sure she would never get over what had happened. Then he thanked her for her time and walked back towards the apartment. And as he was on his way, one thing Marlene had said to DeHill really stood out to him, that Victoria apparently gave money to her family. Money, family, and murder often went hand in hand, so DeHill instructed members of his team to begin looking into Victoria's financial situation, and he asked others to track down members of her family for questioning. DeHill still had not formed any serious theories or opinions about who could have delivered this pipe bomb, but he thought maybe in this case, a family dispute over money that maybe erupted into violence might make more sense than a drug gang putting out a hit on somebody like Victoria. So DeHill just needed to figure out who all Victoria was giving money to and who would have benefited from her death. On the night of Victoria's murder and during the following day, Corporal DeHill and members of his team had contacted and took statements from Victoria's family and friends, and they all basically said the same thing. They loved Victoria. She was a beautiful person and an amazing mother, and they couldn't imagine who would want to hurt her. And Victoria's family were very upfront about the financial aid she had given them all since she'd received her court settlement. But they all insisted that they never wanted to feel like a burden to Victoria and that she helped them because it was something she wanted to do. Now, despite how honest the family and friends seemed to DeHill, he couldn't actually just rule them out because they seemed like good people. The reality was they still needed more information to get to the bottom of Victoria's financial situation to see if that played a role in whatever happened to her. And in conversations with family and friends, DeHill had learned that Victoria had a financial advisor, Brian Malley, who would obviously have a much fuller picture of Victoria's finances. And so, DeHill reached out to Brian and asked him to come meet him at a nearby police station. Brian was a 55-year-old guy who was quite tall and had graying hair. He was known for being very polite and outgoing, traits that had really helped him grow his business. Brian told DeHill that he'd actually been a friend of Victoria's family for years, and he had really gotten to know Victoria when he did construction work on her apartment to make it more wheelchair accessible. He also said when he and Victoria began working together on her finances, that also really brought them together, so they were legitimately good friends. DeHill asked him about his investment strategy for Victoria, and Brian would say, you know, the strategy was very standard. His goal was just to add to the money that Victoria already had. That way her and her daughter could be taken care of in the future. And then he also asked Brian if he could think of anyone who might have wanted to hurt Victoria. And when he asked that question, it was the first time Brian seemed to hesitate. And for a second, DeHill actually thought maybe Brian just didn't hear the question and he was about to ask it again. But then Brian shook his head and broke the silence and said he just could not imagine anybody wanting to do this to Victoria. It just really didn't make sense. DeHill would ask Brian a few more questions and Brian would do his best to answer. And then eventually DeHill thanked Brian for coming in and Brian got up to leave. 
But even before Brian made it out the door, DeHill found himself thinking how strange it was that Brian had hesitated when he was asked, you know, is there anybody out there that you think might want to hurt Victoria? Everybody else who DeHill had asked that question to, family, friends, witnesses, had all pretty much immediately said, no, there's no one. Nobody would want to hurt her. Or certainly I don't know anybody who would want to hurt her. And Brian had basically had the same answer, but again, he had hesitated. And so it could have just been, you know, a brain fart or he zoned out or something. Or maybe there was something more to the hesitation. And so DeHill decided he was going to get to the bottom of it. And DeHill did not need to wait long to get his answer. Because the following day, Brian contacted DeHill and what he said cast Victoria's murder in a whole new light. Brian told DeHill that one of Victoria's brothers, who she gave money to all the time, had a very serious drug problem. He'd been addicted to crack for years. But that wasn't all. Brian also thought there was a real chance that Victoria's brother was a drug dealer and that he had gotten on the wrong side of some pretty serious drug gangs. And so by the time DeHill hung up with Brian, he felt like he had just caught his first major break in this case. One of DeHill's initial thoughts about the crime scene was that the type of homemade bomb used to kill Victoria was often used by people in the drug trade. So DeHill wondered if it was possible that Victoria's brother owed money to drug dealers or had encroached on their territory when dealing drugs on his own or something. And if that was the case, maybe those drug dealers killed Victoria to send a message to her brother. And so soon after this call with Brian, DeHill raced off to go speak with Victoria's brother. And when he did and actually began talking to him, the young man tried to be as helpful as he could, and he admitted openly to struggling with drugs in the past. But he said he never dealt drugs to anyone, and the idea that he had connections to major drug gangs was laughable. DeHill was not ready to just take this guy at his word, but one thing DeHill definitely noticed was Victoria's brother was visibly angry that somebody even suggested that he had something to do with his sister's death. He told DeHill he loved Victoria probably more than he'd loved anybody else in the world. And so after this meeting ended, DeHill did not think he had just gotten any closer to solving the case. However, at the same time, he wasn't ready to just drop the possible connection between drugs and Victoria's murder. And so for now, at least, that was still the best lead he had. On December 3rd, 2011, so a week after Victoria's murder, 250 people gathered at a funeral home to say their final goodbyes to Victoria and to celebrate her life. DeHill and other police officers attended the funeral as well, it's common for investigators to go to funerals of murder victims to see how their friends and family and other potential suspects behave. DeHill listened to the people who were closest to Victoria talk about what an unbelievably amazing person she was, and as he listened to this, he just struggled to understand how someone as wonderful as Victoria ended up with a homemade pipe bomb getting delivered to her house. Now, DeHill had continued to pursue Victoria's brother's possible connection to drug gangs, and in doing that, he had discovered that years earlier, Victoria had made an anonymous call to the police about her neighbors dealing drugs. But DeHill still didn't know if that call had anything to do with her brother, or if somehow the neighbors had figured out who made the anonymous call and then took their revenge on Victoria. But DeHill just could not fathom why any drug dealer would wait years to exact their revenge for a phone call to the cops that didn't really amount to much. A procession of mourners made their way towards Victoria's casket, but DeHill focused on Victoria's young daughter, Destiny. Whoever had done this to Victoria, whether they were connected to the drug trade or not, had robbed this little girl of her mother and robbed her of a safe, happy childhood. Seeing Destiny struggling so hard just to talk about her mother made DeHill so mad. And he was also very frustrated that still he had not honed in on one or two major suspects yet. But still, DeHill tried to stay steady and level-headed. He had plenty of information to work with. He just needed more time to figure out what it all meant. After the funeral, DeHill returned to the station and met with his team. He decided this case could very well hinge on the old adage, follow the money. If they could track where Victoria's money went after she gave it to her brother, it could lead them to the person or people they were looking for. So, for the next several weeks, investigators looked into Victoria's financial transactions dating back to when she had received her court settlement. And investigators were able to follow a paper trail of where and when Victoria's money moved. 
and something they found set off a major alarm. Finally, DeHill had a full picture of what Victoria had done with her money, and he was almost positive he now knew who had killed her. DeHill wanted to act fast, but he also wanted his case to be airtight if it went to trial. So he needed a key piece of evidence that he still lacked. Forensics investigators had managed to pull DNA samples from that piece of paper with Victoria's name on it that had somehow survived the explosion. So now DeHill just had to secure a DNA sample from his newly discovered suspect to see if the DNA matched. Almost six months after Victoria's murder, two investigators trailed their suspect from an unmarked car. The major crimes unit had secured a warrant that allowed them to conduct surveillance on DeHill's new primary suspect. The surveillance process had been very in-depth, and it had taken a lot of time, but it convinced DeHill even further that he was right about who had murdered Victoria. So now, these two investigators who were following the suspect needed to secure a DNA sample from this suspect to back up DeHill's theory. Eventually, the investigators saw the suspect turn off the street and pull into the parking lot of a fast food restaurant. The investigators could not believe their luck. This was the perfect place to get a DNA sample. From inside their unmarked car out in the parking lot, the investigators watched the suspect get out of their car and walk inside the restaurant. The investigators waited a minute, and then they too got out of their car, and they went inside as well. The investigators bought food just to blend in, and then took a seat in a booth towards the back and kept an eye on their suspect. Eventually, the suspect finished their meal, threw their trash into the trash can, and walked outside. And at this point, the investigators sprung into action. They put gloves on their hands, walked over to the trash can, and began fishing around inside of it until they pulled out a napkin the suspect had used to wipe their hands and mouth, and they slipped that napkin into a paper bag. And soon after that, the napkin was sent off for DNA testing. It took a while for the results to come back, but when they did, they showed DeHill exactly what he had been looking for. They were a match. DeHill had found Victoria's murderer. Based on DNA test results, evidence found at the crime scene, and police interviews, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened on November 25th, 2011, the morning that somebody murdered Victoria Shakte. The sun wouldn't rise for hours, but the killer was already hard at work. They sat at a wooden table staring at their creation. They had spent months collecting the necessary items to complete the project, and now they were finally ready to finish it and put it to use. The killer took a big breath in and exhaled slowly through their mouth. They told themselves that staying calm was key. Shaky hands or sudden movements could be very dangerous. The killer slowly put the finishing touches on the pipe bomb, then backed away from the table and let out a huge breath and felt their shoulders relax. They reached down and picked up a white cardboard box off the floor, and they carefully set the bomb inside of the box. They closed the box and then grabbed a piece of paper and a colored pen, and they wrote the word Victoria in large, festive-looking letters on the paper and then taped it to the top of the cardboard box. Finally, the killer picked up a large green and gold gift bag and placed the box inside. A few minutes later, the killer drove through Innisfail and arrived on Victoria's street. They drove a little ways past her apartment and then parked their car. Then, after pulling their dark cap down to cover their face, the killer stepped out of the car and looked up and down the street. It was empty. So they reached into the passenger seat and took the heavy gift bag containing the bomb and they walked carefully towards Victoria's apartment. As they moved, they did their best to stay in the shadows and avoid the streetlights. Finally, the killer reached Victoria's apartment, and they placed the gift bag down right in front of the front door, and then the killer knocked on the door, and then turned and ran away as fast as they could. By the time Marlene opened the door, the killer was already gone. Hours later, at around 9 a.m., Victoria and Marlene returned from Victoria's stepfather's house, and right away, Marlene headed to the kitchen to do the dishes. But while she was at the sink, she didn't hear or see Victoria, who wheeled herself into the kitchen as well, and Victoria grabbed the gift bag off the kitchen table where Marlene had left it, she put it on her lap, and then wheeled herself into the dining room. Victoria opened up the bag and saw there was a white cardboard box inside. She took the box out and let the bag fall to the floor. 
And when this happened, Victoria very likely saw that there was a tag on this box. There was that piece of paper that said Victoria in colorful ink. And so for Victoria, this very likely confirmed in her head that Marlene and her stepfather were overreacting about this box. Clearly, this was just an early Christmas present for Victoria, and it was no big deal. And so Victoria ultimately opened up the box. And when she did, the box exploded. And by the time the explosion actually happened, the killer had already arrived in Edmonton where he had business to conduct and where his wife was going to see the opera. Brian Malley, Victoria's family friend and her financial advisor, was her killer. It would turn out the image of a kind, outgoing, successful businessman that Brian showed the world was nothing more than an act that he had spent years cultivating. In reality, Brian was a former cop who had been kicked off the Edmonton police force about three years after he had joined. Brian's first wife had divorced him because she believed he was a physical threat to her and their daughter, and a second wife had also divorced him because Brian was having an affair with a co-worker. But somehow, Brian had managed to hide all of that, and he sort of reinvented himself when he had moved to the small town of Innisfail. And soon, he had established himself as a reliable construction worker, and then later as an honest and trustworthy financial advisor. But the truth was, Brian never really changed, and he made a habit out of using his clients' money for his own gain, making risky and even illegal investments in the hope that he could make some big money on commissions. And he got away with it for a while. But in 2011, Victoria had started to wonder why her large investment account kept dwindling so quickly. When she had asked Brian about it, he just kept saying the problem was that Victoria gave too much of her money away to her family. But when Victoria continued to push him for more information about what was happening, Brian started to panic. Because he had actually invested over 90% of Victoria's money in a single, very high-risk stock. And that stock had just cratered, so almost all of Victoria's money was now gone. And Brian had never consulted Victoria about doing this investment, so she had no idea what had even happened. He also obviously never disclosed the inherent risk of putting so much money into a single stock. Basically, you can lose everything really quickly. Brian knew his actions violated multiple Canadian financial laws, so he decided the only way to avoid getting caught and going to jail was to kill Victoria and pin the murder on her own brother. Now, Victoria's brother had nothing to do with the murder, and it was never shown that he had ever dealt drugs. But ultimately, it was the investigator's initial pursuit of the brother's possible drug connection to this crime that had led to Hill and his team to uncover Brian's financial crimes. But even with all of this information about his financial crimes, DeHill needed something much more concrete to directly connect Brian to the murder. Luckily, that piece of paper Brian had written Victoria on and then taped to the bomb survived the blast, and DNA samples from that paper ended up matching the DNA sample taken from the napkin that Brian had thrown away when he was at the fast food restaurant. And so after finding that match, DeHill and his team moved in and arrested Brian. Brian was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder and several charges related to constructing and delivering an explosive device. He was sentenced to life in prison with a chance for parole after 25 years. On a bright, cool afternoon in early September of 2006, 22-year-old college senior Mindy Morgenstern walked out of her one-bedroom apartment in the small college town of Valley City, North Dakota. Mindy was tall and athletic, with curly black hair that came down to her shoulders. She wore a tank top, sweatpants, and running shoes. Mindy felt the sun beat down on her face as she carried her two empty laundry baskets down the steps outside of her second-floor apartment to the apartment complex's laundry room on the first floor. As Mindy got close to the laundry room, she heard two of the dryers buzzing. Mindy smiled. She'd clearly timed her trip perfectly. Mindy stepped into the cramped laundry room, pulled her clothes out of each dryer, and piled them into the baskets. Then she headed back towards her apartment. Mindy passed a young couple on the steps, and so she said hello and smiled. It was a pretty small apartment complex, and so Mindy made sure to be friendly to everyone she ran into there. In fact, most of her neighbors knew Mindy as the young woman who always had a smile on her face and a kind word to say. 
the couple said hello back to Mindy and smiled as well, and then Mindy continued the walk back up to her apartment. Mindy grabbed her key from her pocket and she tried to unlock the door, but she was really struggling to balance the laundry baskets in her arms as she tried to do this. At the same time, Mindy heard a voice behind her, and her neighbor, Mo Gibbs, swooped in and grabbed one of the baskets before it fell out of Mindy's arms. Mindy laughed at herself and then got the door open. She took the basket from Mo, thanked him for his help, and she went inside. Mindy put the baskets on the floor and pushed them up against the wall in the entryway. She knew she should probably just put her clothes away now, but she had some studying she wanted to finish first. So Mindy walked into the living room and sat down on the couch. She reached over and grabbed a pen and a notebook from the coffee table, leaned back on the couch, and started reading through some notes on sports medicine that she'd taken for her class. In high school, Mindy had been a basketball star, and she had dreamed of playing in college, and maybe even professionally, in the WNBA someday. But not long after her high school graduation, Mindy had unfortunately been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, or MS for short, is a chronic disease of the central nervous system that can affect a person's vision and movement and can cause fatigue and loss of balance. Since her diagnosis, Mindy had been doing well with treatment and medication, but the disease had forced her to give up playing basketball competitively. But as crushing as that was, Mindy had never let it get her down. She was a religious person who believed God had a plan for everybody, and so she had told herself that being a professional athlete just wasn't part of God's plan for her. But still, Mindy did love sports, and so she wanted to find another way to connect with athletics without actually participating in them. So she had spent her time in college studying to become a physical therapist someday, and she had also started working as an assistant coach for a high school basketball team in the area. In her living room, Mindy was going over her notes when her phone buzzed in her pocket. She put her notes down, grabbed her flip phone, and looked at the caller's number on the small digital display. Mindy took a deep breath. She really didn't want to talk to the person who was calling, but she thought it was rude not to answer. So, feeling resigned, she flipped open the phone and said hello, and she heard the voice of a man in his mid-50s on the other line. And before Mindy could get a word in after saying hello... The man said how excited he was that he'd caught her when she wasn't busy. The man on the other line was Rodney Kuznia, the father of Mindy's ex-boyfriend. Mindy and Rodney's son had broken up over a year ago, but when they were together, it had been very serious. Mindy had even thought they'd get married someday. But her boyfriend had moved to another city for college, and he had gotten tired of being in a long-distance relationship. So he had broken up with Mindy and stopped talking to her. But his father, Rodney, had stayed in Mindy's life. After the breakup, Rodney had called occasionally just to check in on Mindy. Mindy and Rodney had gotten to know each other pretty well when she was dating Rodney's son, so at first, Mindy thought the calls were kind of nice. A father figure just making sure she was okay. But after a short time, it all kind of changed. Rodney had started calling several times a week, and Mindy just didn't really like it. Mindy's friends had told her she needed to cut Rodney off completely, just tell him to never call again. And if he did call, she needed to ignore it. Mindy hadn't gone that far, but she had told Rodney that he really needed to back off and that it wasn't right that he kept calling her all the time. But Rodney clearly had not gotten the message. On this particular phone call, Rodney asked if maybe Mindy would want to get together for dinner sometime. When Mindy heard this, she just sighed. She could hear her friend's voices in her head. You can't do this. Tell him to go away. Then, in a very calm, polite voice, Mindy told Rodney that she did not think that was a good idea. And she told him again that he really needed to stop calling her so much. Mindy then said goodbye, hung up, and slipped her phone back into her pocket. She hoped Rodney would finally take the hint this time and actually leave her alone. Mindy picked up her notes again, but she couldn't focus. The phone call had totally thrown her off. She thought about calling her ex-boyfriend to let him know what was going on, but things hadn't ended well between them, and she didn't feel like stirring up any bad feelings. So she stood up, stretched, and headed outside to take a walk. Even though multiple sclerosis had kept Mindy from pursuing her basketball career, she still stayed very active, and as much as she loved being around other people, she was almost never happier than when she was outside by herself going for a walk, feeling the sun beat down on her with the wind at her back. And that day, going for a walk outside did the trick. 
By the time she got back to her apartment, she'd put the stress of the phone call with Rodney behind her. Once she was back inside her apartment, Mindy carried the laundry baskets to her room and she put her clean clothes away. Then she took a shower, got dressed, and went out to meet her two best friends for dinner. Later that night, when she got back from dinner, Mindy parked her car, stepped outside, and headed up the steps to her apartment. After her walk earlier that day, and now after hanging out with her best friends for the night, Mindy was in a great mood and smiling ear to ear. But then, something strange happened when Mindy got to her door. She felt the hair on her neck stand up. It felt like someone was watching her. She turned around, but she just saw the cars in the parking lot and the outline of the trees in the moonlight across the street. But Mindy still felt uneasy. So she got inside her apartment as fast as she could, and she closed and locked the door. She sat down on the couch and tried to calm herself down. Mindy's friends often made fun of her and said she was afraid of her own shadow. So Mindy told herself her friends must be right, that she was just making things up in her head and getting scared for no reason, and that everything was actually just fine. At around 12.45 p.m. on September 13th, 2006, so over a week after the phone call from Rodney, Mindy walked down the steps outside her apartment, carrying an empty laundry basket in her hands like she'd done a week earlier. Mindy didn't understand how it was already time for her to do laundry again, but she and her two best friends had plans to go out that night, and she hadn't found anything clean that she wanted to wear. So Mindy made her way to the laundry room, took her clean clothes out of the dryer, and piled them high inside of her basket. She was excited to go out that night. She and her friends were always busy with school, with work, or with guys they were dating, but they always made time for each other. And for Mindy, who had grown up in a small town and been really close with her family, having good friends like that made all the difference in the world. Mindy had been nervous when she first moved away from home to go to school, but now she couldn't imagine living somewhere without her two best friends right nearby. Mindy carried the basket out of the laundry room, walked up the steps to her apartment, got her key out of her pocket, and unlocked the door. This time it was a bit easier because she only had the one laundry basket in her arms. Once inside the apartment, Mindy put the laundry basket down and pushed it up against the wall in the entryway. But when she turned around to close her door, she saw someone standing there. Mindy smiled politely and was about to reach out and still just close the door on this person, But before she could, this person just stepped right inside of her apartment and slammed the door behind them. Over an hour later, so at about 2 p.m. that day, Mindy's neighbor, Mo Gibbs, the guy who had helped her get inside of her apartment the week earlier, he stepped out of his apartment carrying a large moving box in his arms. He was going to load up his car downstairs because he, his fiance, and her younger daughter were in the process of moving to another apartment complex. But when Mo walked past Mindy's apartment, he stopped. The scent of a cleaning product or disinfectant hit him really hard, like somebody had poured out a bunch of pine saw nearby. But regardless, Mo just walked past her door and made his way downstairs to the parking lot. And for the rest of the day, other residents of this complex noticed that same really intense chemical smell coming out of Mindy's apartment, but nobody thought it was anything to worry about. Then at about 9 p.m., so roughly seven hours after Mo had passed by the door and first noticed that smell, Mindy's two best friends pulled into the parking lot of Mindy's apartment complex. They had been trying to get a hold of Mindy for a while because they had thought she was going to meet them at a bar that night. But when Mindy never showed, and when she didn't answer her phone, they started to get worried because Mindy always answered her phone. One of Mindy's friends opened the passenger side door, stepped outside, walked through the parking lot, and went up the steps towards Mindy's apartment. But she stopped cold about halfway up because she was hit with that really intense smell that smelled like pine saw. Mindy's friend figured the apartment management must be cleaning the floors or something, So she just kind of shook off the smell and continued walking up to Mindy's door. When she got there, she knocked, but Mindy didn't answer. So the friend banged harder on the door, but still no one came to the door. Then she grabbed the doorknob and she felt it turn in her hand. The door was unlocked. And that seemed really weird because as a young woman living alone, Mindy was hyper vigilant and always made sure to lock her door. 
And so with a lot of apprehension, Mindy's friend opened the door and stepped inside, but immediately they stopped because there was something on the ground that made them scream. The friend fumbled for their phone, pulled it out, dialed 911, and then they turned around to run back outside, go downstairs and tell their friend in the car what they had just seen. But the friend was blocked by a man standing in Mindy's doorway, and suddenly Mindy's friend was screaming even louder. Minutes after Mindy's friend had called 911, Sergeant Dave Swenson of the Valley City Police Department was sitting on his couch watching TV when his phone rang. Swenson glanced down and saw it was the police dispatch. He turned off the TV and answered the phone. On the other line, the dispatcher said they'd just gotten a call from a young woman who was screaming and very upset about something that had happened to her friend. She was so upset that the dispatcher wasn't exactly sure what had even taken place, but the young woman had said something about a strangling. The dispatcher gave Swenson the address of the incident, and he checked and saw it was an apartment complex only about a block from Swenson's house. So he said he'd be over there in a minute and hung up the phone. Swenson was young and was an active part of the small Valley City community. So as he made the short drive down the street, he worried about the young woman who had made the 911 call. It was pretty rare in Valley City for the police to get distraught calls like that. Swenson pulled his car into the apartment parking lot and he saw two women in their early 20s running towards him and a man pacing back and forth a few feet behind them. Swenson parked his car and stepped outside. The lot was pretty dark, but he could still tell that both women coming towards him had obviously been crying. When the women reached him, Swenson introduced himself and then one of the women told him something terrible had happened up in her friend's apartment. Swenson told the women to wait right there and then he rushed past them and the man who was pacing back and forth, and he went up the steps to Mindy's apartment. He walked inside, and immediately he was hit with that smell of pine saw. Then Swenson looked down at the floor, and he saw Mindy's body, and for a second, he almost wanted to cry. Swenson knew Mindy. He had spent time on the college campus where she went to school, and he was a big supporter of the college and high school sports teams in the area, and he had often met Mindy at games. Swenson thought Mindy was one of the kindest, brightest young people he knew, and he couldn't believe what he was now looking at. Mindy was lying on her side just a few feet from the apartment's entryway. Blood covered her shirt, there was a cloth belt wrapped around her throat, and there was a knife with the handle broken off sticking out of her neck. Swenson also saw an empty pine saw bottle laying right next to her. Swenson grabbed his phone out of his pocket and called the station. He knew the small Valley City Police Department was going to need help with a violent crime like this. About 15 minutes later, Special Agents Mark Saylor and Calvin Dupree from the Bureau of Criminal Investigation pulled into the parking lot outside of Mindy's apartment. The Bureau of Criminal Investigation is a state law enforcement agency in North Dakota that aids local police departments with certain cases. Sailor and Dupree stepped out of the car and saw the flashing lights from local police cruisers that had already arrived at the scene. And they saw an officer standing with two young women and a man in the parking lot. Sailor and Dupree waved to that officer and then walked over to the group. Both of the agents were tall with broad shoulders and they both looked very intimidating. Sailor told Mindy's two friends and the man that was with them that he and Dupree would need to ask them some questions, but it might still be a little while. So he thanked them in advance for their patience. Sailor's voice was soft and calm, a contrast to his physical appearance. Sailor and Dupree left the group and walked across the parking lot and up the steps to Mindy's apartment. They put on their gloves and went inside with the few other local officers that were already in there. Like everyone else who had been near Mindy's apartment that day, the first thing Sailor and Dupree noticed beyond Mindy's body was the strong smell of pine saw. The agents approached Mindy's body and crouched down to get a closer look. It was immediately evident to them that whoever had done this had poured pine saw all over Mindy's body and then tossed the empty bottle to the ground. They figured that the killer must have done that to try to get rid of any physical evidence they might have left behind on Mindy's body. After spending a few minutes examining the victim, Sailor and Dupree did a sweep of the small apartment. 
In Mindy's bedroom, they saw photos of her and her parents and of her goofing around with her friends. There were sports trophies and ribbons. And suddenly it just hit both of the agents how young Mindy was and how happy she looked in every picture they had taken of her. It didn't take long for Sailor and Dupree to notice that really nothing in any of the rooms seemed out of place and there was no sign of forced entry. So this did not look like a robbery to them. Not long after the agents had walked through the apartment, state forensics officers arrived. They got right to work examining blood spatter on the floor and on Mindy's body. Then, Sailor and Dupree watched as one of the forensics officers examined Mindy's hands and fingers. And at some point, that officer turned and said he'd found something. Parts of Mindy's fingernails had broken, and she had scratches on her hands. The officer said that indicated that Mindy had put up a fight against her attacker. The forensics officer examined Mindy's fingernails even closer, and he was convinced there would be DNA material from the killer under Mindy's nails. So the officer ordered that Mindy's hands be treated as vital evidence from that moment moving forward. And so another forensics officer approached Mindy's body with two evidence bags, and Sailor and Dupree watched as the forensics officers worked together to painstakingly slide these evidence bags over each of Mindy's hands, And then once they were over, they tied the bags off to keep Mindy's hands from being corrupted until an autopsy could be performed. While the forensics team continued working in the apartment, Sailor and Dupree headed back outside to the parking lot. Once there, they approached Mindy's two friends and that man, who were all still standing with a local officer. Mindy's friend, who had actually discovered the body, told the agents that she and her other friend had wanted to meet Mindy at a bar that night but Mindy never showed up, so they came here to check on her. Then Agent Sailor asked the man who was there if he was a friend too, but the man shook his head. He said his name was Robert Linz, and he was one of Mindy's neighbors. He said he'd heard screaming outside of his apartment, so he'd run out to see what was going on. Then Robert said he saw Mindy's friend in the apartment, and he walked in to make sure she was okay, and that's when he saw Mindy lying on the ground. Sailor and Dupree thanked Mindy's two friends, as well as the neighbor, Robert, and the agent said they would probably need to follow up with all of them soon. Then, Sailor and Dupree walked through the parking lot to go back to Mindy's apartment. But as they walked, they talked about Mindy's neighbor, Robert. The guy was wiry and covered in tattoos, which was really not a typical look for people who lived in Valley City. But Sailor and Dupree didn't really care about Robert's tattoos. What they cared about was they had noticed multiple cuts on one of Robert's hands. In the early morning of September 14th, so several hours after Mindy's body had been discovered, Special Agents Sailor and Dupree stepped outside of Mindy's apartment after a long night of combing the place for evidence. The sun was starting to rise and the morning was quiet, but Sailor and Dupree knew that would change as soon as the news about Mindy's murder began to spread through this small town. The agents had worked enough cases in tight-knit communities to know that panic and fear can easily rip through a place like a virus whenever a horrible crime has been committed. As the state crime lab ran tests on blood and DNA evidence found at the scene, Sailor and Dupree wanted to get a jump on the investigation, and they wanted to start with Mindy's tattooed neighbor, Robert. Sailor and Dupree had enough experience to know that some killers would come right back to the scene of the crime when their victim had been discovered. Killers often did this to monitor police activity or to try to alter evidence before police arrived. The agents did not think Mindy's two girlfriends had anything to do with her murder, but Robert seemed like a legitimate suspect. Forensics officers had said they believed Mindy put up a fight, and Robert had those fresh cuts all over his hand. So, Sailor and Dupree began by running a quick background check on Robert. The check revealed that Robert had moved to North Dakota from California. And when he was still in California, he had served over two years in prison for stealing a car at gunpoint. Later that morning, Sailor and Dupree interviewed Robert in a small interrogation room at the local police station. Robert was very jittery, like he couldn't sit still during this interview, but he was polite and respectful when he answered the agent's questions. Robert told them again that he had just heard a woman screaming outside of his apartment so he had gone out to see what was wrong, 
Then he said he actually stood in the doorway of Mindy's apartment, which initially scared the friend. Then he had actually gone in and checked for Mindy's pulse with the back of his hand, but he couldn't find one, and so that was when he knew she was dead. Sailor and Dupree looked at each other, almost like they weren't sure what they had just heard. Dupree asked Robert why he would check Mindy's pulse with the back of his hand and not the tips of his fingers. And without hesitating, Robert said he did that because he did not want to leave his fingerprints on the body. The agents just stared at Robert for a second. For him to be more concerned about leaving fingerprints on the body than just simply finding a pulse in this critical, time-sensitive moment, it just seemed off. It frankly seemed like the actions of a criminal or of a killer. But Sailor and Dupree knew this guy had done time in prison, so there was a chance he understood if fingerprints were found on a dead body, he would automatically become a primary suspect, and the cops might not give him the benefit of the doubt. So, Sailor and Dupree were not going to proclaim Robert's guilt right away, no matter how strange and suspicious his actions were. Then, the agents asked Robert how he got the cuts on his hand. And Robert said he had gotten them the day before at the steel manufacturing plant where he worked. He said getting cuts like this was just part of the job. Sailor asked Robert if he would submit samples for a DNA test, and Robert said he would. Shortly after, an officer stepped into the interrogation room and swabbed the inside of Robert's mouth for the DNA sample. Then Dupree and Sailor let Robert go, but they told him not to leave Valley City because they might want to speak to him again. Later that day, officers followed up on Robert's alibi that he had been at work, and multiple people at the steel manufacturing plant said, yep, Robert had been working at the time Mindy had supposedly been murdered. But Sailor and Dupree weren't ready to write off Robert as a suspect quite yet. It was possible his friends could be lying for him, or that they simply had not seen him leave work at some point during the day. Still, Sailor and Dupree did not want to fixate on just one suspect while they were still waiting on test results from DNA samples found under Mindy's fingernails. And because there had been no sign of forced entry into Mindy's apartment, the agents thought there was a good chance Mindy had known her killer. So they focused their investigation on two groups, Mindy's friends and her neighbors. A couple of days into the investigation, and Agent Sailor and Dupree returned to Mindy's apartment complex to interview as many of her neighbors as possible. The agents were accompanied by a local officer, and when they all got to the parking lot, that officer immediately recognized someone. Mindy's neighbor, Mo Gibbs, the man who had helped Mindy hold her laundry while she unlocked her door a couple of weeks earlier, was loading more moving boxes into his car. Mo was a jailer at the county jail, and so he knew most of the officers at the Valley City Police Department. The officer waved hello to Mo and said that they'd love to talk to him to see if maybe he could help them with their investigation. Mo said he'd be happy to help, and he slid a moving box into the back seat of his car and then walked over to that officer and the two agents. Mo was this really tall, huge guy who was built kind of like a tank, and he had a big smile and bright eyes. Agent Sailor said to Mo that because he worked in law enforcement, he might have noticed something on the day of Mindy's murder that the other people in the apartment complex who did not work in law enforcement might have missed. Mo nodded and thought about it for a second, and then he said the one thing he had noticed was the smell of disinfectant on the second floor of the apartment complex on the day Mindy died but he had just figured somebody was going overboard with their cleaning. Then, Sailor asked if Mo could give them any other information about Mindy that could possibly point them in the right direction. Mo said he didn't know Mindy well, but everybody at that complex knew Mindy was like this unbelievably nice person who was kind to everyone. And so Mo said, you know, he couldn't imagine anyone who actually lived in the apartments doing this to her. That maybe it was somebody who did not live in this complex. The special agents and the local officer thanked Mo for his insight, and then they began making their way towards the complex to begin doing interviews with other neighbors. And throughout the day, as Sailor and Dupree talked to more of Mindy's neighbors, they almost all told the same story as Mo. Mindy was nice to everybody, and she always seemed happy, and so they couldn't understand how anyone from this complex, or really anywhere, would have wanted to hurt her. That day, investigators were able to take DNA samples from a number of Mindy's neighbors, but the tests would take time, and investigators couldn't automatically rule anyone out yet. So, Sailor and Dupree shifted their focus from the people at the apartment complex to Mindy's friends, 
and right away, several of Mindy's friends all said the same thing. The police needed to look into Mindy's ex-boyfriend. He and Mindy's breakup had been pretty bad, and most of her friends thought Mindy still had feelings for him, but he didn't feel the same way. So there was a chance that maybe they'd gotten into a fight and things maybe turned violent. The following day, Sailor and Dupree met with Mindy's ex-boyfriend, who went to college in a different city. And they discovered pretty quickly that he had been on his own college campus at the time they believed Mindy had been killed. But Mindy's ex-boyfriend told Sailor and Dupree this story that seemed so bizarre to them that they almost immediately changed the focus of their entire investigation. Mindy's ex-boyfriend said that his own father, Rodney Kuznia, was obsessed with Mindy. And no matter how many times he had asked his dad to stop calling Mindy and to please leave her alone, his dad had refused. Rodney would tell his son that he and everybody else didn't understand the powerful connection he shared with Mindy. Soon after talking to Mindy's ex-boyfriend, Sailor and Dupree were able to search Mindy's cell phone records, and they discovered that Rodney had called Mindy several days in a row leading up to the murder. Then they also saw that he had left Mindy multiple voicemails after she had been killed. And when they listened to those voicemails, they heard Rodney crying and saying he knew what had happened to Mindy and how he couldn't believe he had been robbed of having her in his life. And so based on those voicemails and the conversation they'd had with Mindy's ex-boyfriend, Sailor and Dupree were convinced that Rodney did have a very unhealthy obsession with the 22-year-old Mindy. They also believed Rodney was ultimately interested in having a full-blown romantic relationship with Mindy, or at the very minimum, a sexual relationship with her. And they thought, you know, maybe if Rodney had shown up to Mindy's apartment to try to act on those desires, but Mindy denied him, that Rodney might have snapped and killed her. A few days after Mindy's murder, Agent Sailor and Dupree sat across a small table from Rodney inside of a police station interrogation room. Rodney had white hair and a white mustache that went down to his chin and looked like a horseshoe. He wore jeans, a t-shirt, and a camouflage trucker hat. From the minute Rodney sat down, he had tears in his eyes. Sailor began by asking Rodney to explain his relationship with Mindy. Rodney said he was like a father to her, but then he immediately followed that up by saying he actually loved Mindy because she reminded him so much of his wife when his wife was young. Rodney said his family did not really understand his feelings for Mindy, and they didn't really know how often he talked to her. He said if they did, they would be even angrier with him than they already were. Sailor and Dupree just sat there with stunned looks on their faces. They had seen plenty of older men who were interested in younger women, but there was something about Rodney that just seemed totally different to them. And neither of them could tell if this guy was putting on some elaborate act to cover up what he did, or if he was really paralyzed with grief. Then Rodney looked up at the agents with his red eyes and said, quote, God picked a beautiful flower, end quote. And then Rodney started crying even more. Sailor and Dupree kept looking over at each other, wondering if maybe one of them should step forward and kind of calm Rodney down and get him to talk again. But neither of them wanted to stop Rodney in fear he might suddenly admit something because of how upset he was. And so Sailor and Dupree just kind of sat there and let Rodney cry. Finally, Rodney would collect himself and he would sit up straight and wipe the tears from his eyes. And then Sailor asked him where he had been on the day of Mindy's murder. And Rodney said he had been working on his farm with one of his sons. Sailor asked Rodney if he would submit a DNA sample for testing, and Rodney said he would. So, after an officer had swabbed Rodney's mouth for samples, Sailor and Dupree decided to let him go. At least until they got the DNA test results back and they had looked into his alibi. Rodney stood up in the interrogation room, he hugged the agents, and walked out. The interview with Rodney proved to be one of the strangest that Sailor and Dupree had ever conducted. But despite being totally unsure if Rodney really was just sad or was involved, he now was the leading suspect, along with Mindy's neighbor, Robert, who had checked Mindy's pulse with the back of his hand. But the investigators wanted the results of both men's DNA tests before they'd be willing to make an arrest. So in the meantime, they continued to dig into their suspect's alibis to see if they could find any flaws and maybe catch a clear break in the case. On September 19th, 2006, so six days after Mindy's murder, 
almost 500 people gathered in a local high school gym for Mindy's memorial service. Mindy's parents had planned to have the service in their church, where Mindy had spent so much time when she was younger, but there had been such a large public outpouring for Mindy that her parents knew the church would not be big enough to hold everyone who wanted to pay their respects. In the high school gym, Mindy's friends talked about what a light in the world Mindy had been, how she was that rare kind of person who dedicated herself to spreading joy and making other people's lives better. And Mindy's parents urged people to remember Mindy as the happy, kind, beautiful young woman she had been. It was still less than a week after Mindy's murder, but in the days leading up to the memorial service, pressure had really started to mount on the investigation. Local residents called into the police station, wanting to know if it was safe for them to leave their houses and just walk the streets of Valley City. Sailor and Dupree understood their concerns. An unsolved murder in a small town often convinced people that they could be the next victim. But Sailor and Dupree felt like they were getting close to finding Mindy's killer. Mindy's ex-boyfriend's father, Rodney, had been obsessed with her. An obsession was definitely a viable motive. Then there was her neighbor, Robert, who had gone out of his way not to leave fingerprints at the scene. And so Sailor and Dupree were almost certain that when the DNA test results came in, those results would lead them right to Rodney or Robert. On September 20th, the day after Mindy's memorial service, Agent Sailor received a call while he and Dupree were meeting with the investigative team at the Valley City Police Station. Sailor picked up his phone, and someone from the state crime lab told him that they had the results back from several of the DNA tests that were taken during the investigation. And one of those samples matched the DNA samples taken from under Mindy's fingernails. And it turned out those DNA samples belonged to someone who already had a criminal record. Sailor hung up the phone and told Dupree what he just heard. Then the agents thanked the local officers on the investigative team for all their hard work, and Sailor said they now knew who had killed Mindy. Based on DNA test results, evidence found at the scene of the crime and on the victim's body, and interviews conducted throughout the investigation, here is a reconstruction of what investigators believe happened on September 13, 2006, the day someone murdered 22-year-old Mindy Morgenstern. At 12.45 p.m. that day, the killer watched Mindy pull her clean clothes out of the dryer inside of her apartment complex's laundry room. The killer thought about going up and speaking to Mindy, but ultimately they decided it would be better if they surprised her. So the killer stepped away from the laundry room and quickly walked across the first floor of the apartment complex. Then they ran up the steps to the second floor, they eyed Mindy's apartment, and then walked around a corner so they could see her apartment without being seen themselves. Then the killer waited for a couple of minutes, but it felt like an eternity. Finally, the killer saw Mindy reach the top of the steps and walk towards her apartment door. Then they watched as Mindy reached into her pocket and took out her key. At this point, the killer quickly moved from their hiding spot around the corner and walked toward Mindy's front door. And they were only a few feet away when Mindy stepped inside and pushed the laundry basket up against the wall. The killer stepped right into Mindy's doorway, and when Mindy turned around to close and lock the door, the killer just stood there smiling. Mindy smiled back, but before Mindy could say anything, the killer grabbed her by the shoulders and shoved her back into the entryway. Then the killer stepped inside her apartment and slammed the door, trapping both of them inside. The killer moved in on Mindy, but Mindy lunged at the killer. Mindy was fast and strong, and she thrashed at the killer, but the killer was able to get a hold of Mindy and wrap their arms around her and throw her hard to the floor. Mindy lay there for a second stunned, and as she did, the killer glanced around the room and saw a cloth belt near the pile of clothes in the laundry basket. Without thinking, the killer grabbed the belt and then crouched over Mindy, and before Mindy could try to get to her feet, the killer began wrapping the belt around Mindy's throat, and they began tightening their grip. Mindy scratched and clawed at the killer's hands, but they held on tight and kept pulling harder and harder on that belt. Mindy gasped for air over and over again until she couldn't anymore, and then finally the killer loosened their grip, and Mindy collapsed fully on the floor and stopped fighting. But 
the killer could still hear Mindy wheezing. She was alive. And the killer knew they had already been in the apartment much longer than they had planned. So the killer left Mindy struggling to catch her breath on the floor, with the belt still wrapped around her neck, and they rushed into the kitchen. They began pulling open all the drawers until they found a large, sharp kitchen knife. Then the killer took that knife and marched back to where Mindy was still on the floor. The killer crouched down again, grabbed Mindy by the hair, tilted her head back, put the blade just above where the belt was wrapped around her, and slit Mindy's throat. Afterwards, the killer jabbed the knife deep into Mindy's neck. Blood poured down Mindy's neck and onto her shirt and arms, and then Mindy died. The killer stood up and looked down at Mindy's body. Suddenly, they started to panic. There was so much blood, and Mindy had really fought back. The killer knew they must have left physical evidence on her body, and there were definitely fingerprints on the knife. So the killer darted back into the kitchen and threw open the cabinets under the sink. And there, they found a pair of rubber cleaning gloves and a bottle of pine saw. The killer put on the gloves, grabbed the bottle that was almost full, and went back to Mindy's body. The killer put the bottle down on the floor, then they gripped the knife handle sticking out of Mindy's neck in one hand, and then braced the other hand against Mindy's shoulder, and they broke off the knife handle. Then they pocketed the handle and grabbed the bottle of pine saw. They opened it up and poured it all over Mindy's face, shirt, arms, and legs. When the bottle was empty, the killer just dropped it on the floor next to Mindy. They stood up and walked to the door. The killer cracked open the door and looked out into the hallway to make sure nobody was close by. Then they stepped out into the hall, shutting the door behind them. They turned, they walked down the hall, they turned the corner, and went into their own apartment. Once inside, the killer got rid of the knife handle in the trash and rinsed off their hands and face in the sink. Not long after that, the killer stepped out of their apartment like nothing had happened, and they began heading down to the parking lot to load their car with moving boxes. It would turn out Mo Gibbs, who was Mindy's neighbor and a county jailer, murdered Mindy Morgenstern. Mo had often seen Mindy around the apartment complex, and at times, he had even watched her from the shadows. Then, a little over a week before the murder, Mo had helped her hold her laundry while she was able to unlock her door and get inside of her apartment, and it was during that brief interaction that Mo decided he had to have sex with her. But Mo and his fiance were moving out of the apartment complex soon, and he felt like he had to move fast. So on May 13th, when he saw Mindy doing laundry again, he decided it was time to act. After the murder, Mo had just gone about his business like normal, loading up his car and texting his fiance. But when he had smelled the strong scent of pine saw, he worried that he might have gone too far and that the smell might draw attention to the scene. But hours passed without anybody going into Mindy's apartment, and even when Mindy's friend found her body later that night, Mo didn't panic. He just kept going to work, spending time with his fiance and his daughter, and getting ready to move like everything was fine. But when the DNA test results came in, they pointed investigators directly to Mo. And so Agents Saylor and Dupree started digging into Mo's history, and they discovered he was not the man he said he was. Years before Mindy's murder, he had changed his name to Mo Gibbs, come to Valley City, and taken up an entirely new identity. This had allowed Mo to hide the fact that he had prior convictions when he applied for his job at the county jail. But Mo's past came out when the DNA under Mindy's fingernails matched the samples he had provided. Because it also turned out that Mo's DNA samples matched DNA samples found in an unsolved rape case that had taken place years earlier in Fargo, North Dakota. And so police came to believe that Mo had attacked Mindy in her apartment with the intention of ultimately raping her. But when Mindy had fought back so fiercely, Mo abandoned that plan and just killed her. Police arrested Mo, and following his arrest, six women came forward and accused him of sexually assaulting them while they were prisoners in the county jail where he worked. And one of those women actually said Mo had sexually assaulted her just hours before Mindy was murdered. 
Mo Gibbs was found guilty of Mindy's murder, and he pled guilty to six counts of rape stemming from the accusations made by the women who had come forward. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you enjoyed today's story, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, just called Mr. Ballin, where we have hundreds more stories just like this one, but many of them are only available on YouTube. Again, that channel is just called Mr. Ballin. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.